So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us um, today. Um, my name is Mike Reed. I currently serve as the director of the Center for Pandemic Preparedness and Response here at uh, the Institute for Global Health Sciences. Um, each month here at the Institute, uh, we are inviting experts from across the UCSF campus and beyond to ask the question, how do we prevent the next pandemic? What policies, programs, and research is critical to ensuring that the next emerging infectious disease threat is not nearly as calamitous as the last one has been. And I think today's session promises to be especially illuminating. Um, but before I begin, um, maybe I can give you a quick plug for next month's session. Um, on, no, on, on April the 18th at 12 p.m., um, we're fortunate enough to have Dr. Monica Gandhi, Professor of Medicine and Director of UCSF Center for AIDS Research speaking with us. Monica will be sharing insights from her upcoming book, Endemic, a post-pandemic playbook, uh, which will be in press later this summer. Details about this event um, are in the chat and also on our website. We'd love to see you then. Uh, however, without further ado, let me set the scene for this morning's session. Today, we welcome Dr. Uh, Eric Goosby and Dr. Tony Fauci to discuss what we can learn from the response to COVID and how we prevent the next pandemic. And honestly, I think, Neither of our discussants really need any introduction, but let me introduce them anyway. First, let me introduce Dr. Eric Goosby. Eric is a professor of medicine and infectious diseases here at UCSF. Over the course of his career, uh, he has played numerous uh, national and global leadership roles in the fight against HIV. He served as the first director of the Ryan White Care Act under President Clinton, and then as the global AIDS coordinator in charge of PEPFAR during President Obama's tenure. More recently, he served as the UN Special Envoy for Tuberculosis. I've gotten to work very closely with Eric over the last uh, six to seven years, and I can honestly say it's been one of the greatest privileges of my professional life. Um, secondly, let me welcome Dr. Tony Fauci. Uh, Dr. Fauci's scholarly accolades are, are really too numer numerous to mention. He's, he's published over 1,200 research articles. He's been an advisor to seven presidents. He's been awarded dozens of awards for his contributions to science. Uh, while he has recently stepped down from his role at the NIH after 54 years of service, it's not an understatement to say that he is the embodiment of, of the biomedical and public health research enterprise in the United States. And in the last three years, nobody has been a more tireless champion of truth and sound science than Dr. Fauci. Um, who knows where the US response to COVID would have ended up without his influence on national policy since the start of the pandemic. Dr. Fauci, we, we welcome you to San Francisco, albeit virtually today. Thank you, Mike. Good to be with you. Thank you. Um, let me, uh, before we begin, uh, before I hand the, the reins over to Eric, a word on format. This session will be a, a relatively informal Q&A, a, a far side chat of sorts between two long-standing friends and colleagues. However, we know that many of you have questions for Dr. Fauci, so feel free to add them to the chat and my colleague Jess Celentano and I will share some of those questions with Dr. Fauci before the end of the session. Also, uh, we, we know that, that many of you would, would like the opportunity to, to share a, a personal note of appreciation with Dr. Fauci, and you can do that too. Uh, please link to the kudos board, which is, you'll find in the chat in a moment, uh, if you want to share a, a, an appreciation with him. But without further ado, let me hand over to you, Eric, and, and over to you, Dr. Fauci. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate um, your comments. They're very kind. I just want to say that Tony Fauci, for me, is a colleague, a mentor, and a friend. And uh, those are uh, wonderful uh, categories to be, but it's unusual to have someone who covers all three of the uh, of the arenas, and for that, I'm deeply grateful. Uh, we go back uh, to the beginning of the outbreak uh, of HIV uh, in the early 80s, and have been in one way or another walking uh, together uh, uh, along that route, uh, understanding and realizing uh, the um, importance of appreciation of population, uh, accessing population, uh, retaining individuals in care and services, and the trusted nature that that requires for populations to uh, react to government and uh, medical institutions' ability to educate or to bring into care and services. Dr. Fauci has been a leader in molding our understanding 
of what our responsibility is as a government in understanding the science, the application of the science, and the availability of that science to different populations in our complex communities. Uh, his entire work from the very beginning, starting from a scientific orientation, the NIH uh, context, uh, always included issues of access and um, uh, what I would say issues of equity long before they were discussed. Uh, the community's insistence in being included in planning and in implementing uh, at first, uh, not something that was recognized by uh, the government agencies. I would say Tony was the critical catalyst to force those conversations and broaden government's understanding of the importance of putting the population that depends and needs these services at the table of planning and implementing. So we're going to go through a series of uh, kind of prompts that I will try to get uh, Tony to uh, elaborate on. Uh, he is free to go in any direction he wants. If he thinks that this is a completely inappropriate moment, I'm, uh, I'm game for him to uh, jump into another arena. One of the remarkable lessons that I attribute to Dr. Fauci is his ability to take science uh, and take that scientific principle and the context in which this new discovery uh, uh, arrives and explain it to a non-medical or scientific brain, the policymaker, who is in the position of having to make that final decision. The beauty of what Dr. Fauci consistently has done is explain these areas so the policymaker understands the consequences, not just the idea, but the consequences of their decisions. And that usually plays out differently in different populations. I would like to ask you, Dr. Fauci, how did you manage situations where the policy was at odds with your recommendations that the principal decided to move forward with, or where there wasn't enough information to give to the principal to make an accurate decision but time, urgency, necessity required a decision to be made. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you for your kind comments. Um, you bring up things that are at really the crux of the tension that we often face when we try to, as you articulated a moment ago, get scientific principles integrated into convincing a policymaker about a certain policy. Um, you know, when, if I can jump to your second question first, I couldn't help but flash back uh, to when you and I were doing things way before HIV, and that is sort of in our medical training. Because there are sometimes, as you know, and being a physician isn't the only arena in which this occurs, but often when you are taking care of a patient, you have a limited amount of information at the time that you have to make a clinical decision. And what it comes down to is judgment and experience all in one to make you decide whether you're going to pursue a certain intervention, a certain diagnostic, a certain therapeutic, or just watch and wait and see what happens. I found it was the same thing that when we had to make decisions and it goes all the way back to the early years of HIV, and as most recently, as the early months of COVID-19, when we were dealing with a target that was not only a moving target, it was a running target, because from January to February to March, things or our appreciation of the situation evolved mm -hmm. rather rapidly. And we were in a, a position that was uncomfortable, but we just had to accept it and act accordingly about making recommendations when you're not sure of the efficiency of transmissibility. Is there aerosol or not? Do asymptomatic people transmit? Will the virus continue to accelerate and then go back down? 
What about the unexpected, like the appearance of new variants? So really, Eric, it comes down to a matter of getting all of the information at the time that you have it, synthesize it, articulate it in a way where people can understand what you're talking about. When you're in a scientific arena, I have a bunch of rules for communication, both with federal and government authorities, as well as with the general public, is that the goal is not to impress them how smart you are. The goal is to get them to understand what you're talking about based on the data that you have. So that to me is a critical way that you make um, decisions and actions on incomplete data. The other first part of the question is, you know, when you're dealing with policymakers, it really gets back to what I said a moment ago, that you really got to get them to understand the facts and the data upon which you're making your recommendation. And if that doesn't agree with existing policy, it is really incumbent upon you to try and modify that policy. You can't do it, but you have to convince the people who are in a position to modify the policy to do that. And it's really a question of using your powers of persuasion based on scientific data and evidence, because everything that we do has to be fundamentally grounded in data, science, and evidence. Very true. Thank you for that. I think um, people who are have not been in situations where they are playing that principal scientific advisory role to a principal who's making budgetary decisions have, um, I think, uh, difficulty in understanding at a country level the ramifications. But I have to say that the role that you've played in dialogues around our domestic response to HIV and other outbreaks really informed the multilateral and na international dialogue as it moved forward. And it strikes me as you're giving an answer that your um, ability to be in front of the individuals who are going to use your formulation of the problem uh, is often distant or not available. And you are frequently in a position where your argument has been taken in front of your ability to uh, brief uh, a principal, especially in a multilateral European base. But those individuals are involved in decisions that affect global cooperation and shared responsibility. I'm just curious, Dr. Fauci, what your feelings are in our role as the US government, the largest economic force on the planet in responding to global threats. Uh, do we have a different role than countries with less economic prowess? The answer is yes, uh, we, we do. Uh, but there, there are certain aspects of that that I wanna maybe unpack for, for our listeners, um, Eric. And that is when, when you're coming at it from a perspective of a, of a rich, powerful, influential country, like the United States, and you're talking about global issues, particularly in the arena of global health, the, the critical issue is that there are some commonalities that transcend any country, rich, poor, developing, developed, it doesn't matter. There are certain things that will be common when you're dealing with a global threat, like a pandemic. But the critical issue is that you have to be absolutely sensitive to the individual differences within a given country or a different region. Mm -hmm. and that's the real knack of it. Yeah. You can't apply or recommend things that are applicable and appropriately applicable in the United States, but may not be completely applicable in a developing country, even though the pandemic or the emerging pathogen is the same. The clinical manifestations are the same, but the circumstances are different. And I think you had multiple years of experience with that, Eric, that you might want to share for a moment with the listeners 
when you were the ambassador and director in charge of PEPFAR, when the HIV AIDS epidemic was a global and is a global pandemic, and yet there were things that were commonalities that we would apply in Southern Africa and other developing countries that we had to understand the individual um, specific, maybe idiosyncrasies in those countries to make it apply. I think that's a perfect example mm -hmm. of how you can't have total uniformity in how you apply principles of response to an outbreak. I think the PEPFAR developing world concept is a great example of that. Thank you. Uh, it, it, I think you characterize it well. It, it is an example of that. I think that be coming um, clearer on what a shared responsibility is. Uh, we, we develop science, we develop innovations, but the, uh, the context in which those advances can be implemented are always different and apply differently across the population that could benefit from them. And I really have to smile for you to identify that as one of the central pieces that needs to be understood. Also for our domestic distribution of resources, the same principles are there. The degree of difference from those with and those without ex can expand in different settings, but the same principle is there. I wanted to um, turn just a little bit to the um, kind of the never ending epidemic of tuberculosis. You appropriately um, advanced uh, tuberculosis, uh, natural history, pathophysiology. You saw the need for a better understanding of uh, our mechanism of immune response in the tubercular response, uh, the lack of understanding of that and how that put kind of our corporate pharma response to developing diagnostics and targets at a disadvantage. What do you think um, is the reason in this post-COVID kind of re-equilibration as we kind of stand back up from the COVID onslaught? Uh, should we think differently about epidemics in the past, the TB, the HIV, that we didn't completely engage and take out? And how should we think about that as we factor in new threats in the pandemic threat context? Yeah. The plate. That's a great question. And I, I'm, I, I, I have an answer that I think some people may sort of, you know, take wow. a step back at. Okay. <laughs> and that is that uh, the, the emergence of new outbreaks should refocus our attention on outbreaks of diseases that have been pandemic for centuries. Very well. Uh, because something has been pandemic for centuries doesn't mean that it is not amenable to the same sort of full court press that you put on addressing a brand new emerging outbreak. And that was one of the things that I tried to do years ago, and, I, and I'm still trying, and you are too, <laughs> um, particularly with your recent leadership in the arena of tuberculosis. I mean, tuberculosis right now, if this were an acute outbreak of tuberculosis with the same level of the degree of morbidity and mortality that we have, we would be responding to it the way we're responding to COVID or HIV or chikungunya or Ebola or something like that. But because of the centuries long history, we need to have to jumpstart it. It's almost, you wanna push the reset button on that. And I think we did that a bit a few years ago mm -hmm. and we're doing much, much better off now, particularly you know, we didn't have a new drug. You know the story. I mean, maybe some of our younger listeners didn't appreciate it, but we went for 45 years without a single new drug for tuberculosis. You know, a disease that kills you know, hundreds of thousands of people and a million people and more a year. We didn't have a new drug for 40, 45 years until only most recently we're developing. So we really need to remember when you have 
what some people refer to as forever pandemics, you know, malaria, tuberculosis, that they shouldn't have to be forever. They can be addressed as if they were a brand new outbreak because in the 21st century, we have brand new technologies and innovations that we didn't have 40, 50, 60 years ago when we were struggling to get any drug for tuberculosis. I mean, that's what we have to do. We have to put the reset button. Yeah, I violently agree with you. So thank you. <laughs> I, I want to frame everything you just said. Uh, the disparity with tuberculosis is tragic. It's ongoing and it can't be sustained. And you said it beautifully. Uh, what a frustration it has been. And I think um, our global awareness of that needs to grow. Uh, and just as you said, our response to any pandemic threat should not exclude those threats that are already on the table and in front of us. Um, I think that uh, you've um, characterized uh, a one, you indirectly explained uh, our role in a shared responsibility agenda uh, that the United States and countries that have economic capability have an obligation that we don't talk about much to use that economic strength to support colleagues in countries that don't and to work with those uh, leaders in countries to speak to their domestic populations and legislatures around increasing domestic support of what historically has been dominated by donor resources. I think our, our inability to move resources where they're needed and sustain them has to be complemented by the domestic investment that each of the countries that we have been in for many years, with HIV in particular, uh, have to advance their domestic support. Our attempt to do that has been dependent on multilateral dialogues and engagement and I'm curious with your special perspective that you've had for years now, looking at multilateral, understanding the tension between domestic budget and uh, multilateral budget strain and that there's only so much money. Can you or do you envision a different relationship with multilateral discussions around global health? And specifically, do you see a role for global health diplomacy in that context, coming out of foreign service departments, agencies, offices, versus coming out of departments of health and human services. I'm curious what your vision, broader vision is over the uh, how we handle these needs and responding to them. Any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, Eric, thanks. Well, first of all, let me start off by just commenting that that is a really very important, unfortunately enduring problem that we've all met, those of us who've been in the public health arena for decades, is just what you said. I mean, the importance of donor countries getting things jump-started in countries that have virtually no resources, but the ultimate uh, dooming to failure of those efforts if you don't have sustainability at the domestic level. So when you were talking about the broader picture, I think it's got to be both uh, you know, uh, diplomacy, health diplomacy, as well, you know, from multiple departments, from health departments, as well as from the State Department, from USAID, and others, to really engage with the governments and the health departments in countries that if we are going to make the investment, which I believe in many respects, Eric, we have a moral responsibility mm -hmm. to do that. And I've always felt that way. There are many people who disagree with me, who feel that we should not feel any obligation to anything outside of our own borders. I, I, I just respectfully disagree with that. But once we do that, we can't let it be a blank check with no responsibility and no accountability. You know, that was one of the principal concepts that President George W. Bush explicitly told me when he asked me to go and put together the fundamental foundation for the PEPFAR program. He said he wanted to be A, transforming 
and be accountable because he felt to make investments over a period of years and the plan was to do that we started off with 15 billion dollars over five years yep. to treat two million people to prevent seven million infections and to care for 10 million people fast forward 20 years and it was just two weeks ago where we celebrated the 20th anniversary of pepfar we've now invested over 110 billion dollars and have saved 25 million lives there's no way that that could have been done without the sustainability that you're talking about because that was one of the prerequisites of making that investment and sure enough it was proven to be successful because many of the successful endeavors that were implemented over the last three years in the southern african countries against covid were really based on the foundation of what PEPFAR built up. So it's an absolutely perfect example of what you're referring to. It was a sustainability in a country of an investment that was initiated 20 years ago. So the answer is we've got to do things, we've got to continue those types of approaches. Thank you. I, th I think that um, the need for continued donor support is evident. The need for increased domestic support is evident in every outbreak, especially in uh, HIV and tuberculosis. But in any outbreak, you've got that dynamic, that duo. And I feel that we haven't solidified a forum that allows for resources to be um, identified, shared, and synergies created. Uh, we are much better at coming in with separate bilateral efforts uh, or even within governments, different efforts in the same city, region, community by different agencies within our own government, uh, almost competing for uh, sites, et cetera. Instead of turning that orchestration effort back to the governments that we're working in, for them to make those decisions about who, where, what, and when. That is so distant in so many of the large resource infusions into governments such as the Global Fund and PEPFAR, Gavi, uh, vaccine efforts that, uh, that are, are revved up around COVID, that I'm worried that we really need to actively uh, relook at the uh, forums, platforms, leaderships, and kind of relationships that multilaterals have not well defined. Uh, so we can do just what you're saying, Tony, in terms of sustaining these uh, resources and these capabilities uh, for forever, for as long as people need them. As, as you look at the uh, portfolio of NIH and NIAID in particular, how would you say um, your uh, the choices that you've made in how you identify needs, unmet needs, research inquiries that should be priority uh, with uh, working groups and uh, of experts that uh, feed to leadership uh, lists of met unmet needs and how to prioritize them? Uh, are you thinking that the NIAID, NIH approach to uh, uh, to the research, the to the research effort is is a good one, or is it in need of reform? The basic outlines work. You know, I think for the most part, uh, well, first of all, nothing is ever perfect. That's for sure. Um, so mm -hmm. to say that it requires no change at all, I think would be naive. I think for the most part, it is solid. Uh, but the one thing that I insisted on, literally on a yearly basis, for the 38 years that I was the director of NIAID, was that you had to intermittently, and I would do it as frequently as once every year or so, take a look at what you've done and question it. Uh, even if you're really very successful, and people are lauding you for saying, wow, what a great job you're doing. You never rest on the laurels and you always figure out a way to do it better. 
the fundamental core principle of how we planned our approaches, Eric, was to look at two fundamental issues. One, what is the scientific opportunity? And two, how does that balance with the public health need? So you essentially assign resources where there is a clear public health need, where you have either the scientific opportunity that you want to fund, or as we did now retrospectively very successful with HIV in the 1980s, pour resources in and create scientific opportunities. Mm -hmm. That was what we did. Remember, we got, you know, very few people were interested in this new disease among handfuls of young gay men mm -hmm. in LA, San Francisco, and New York. And we had to get people interested in that. And we put money into that. And you may or may not recall, Eric, but I got a lot of pushback <laughs> from members of the infectious disease and scientific community of why you were pouring so much money into this curiosity of a disease that many people found were going nowhere. What we did is we created the scientific opportunities of a disease that we predicted would have a great public health impact. So those are the kind of choices you make that I try to make as my directorship over that period of time. A remarkable tenure, uh, truly breathtaking in the problems you were confronted with, and uh, impressive. And I and I would underline that in how consistently your approaches uh, hit home, moved the agenda, brought those that didn't understand it along quickly, uh, and your credibility expanded, was enhanced throughout uh, with with. Uh, uh, one after the other. So truly a remarkable uh, balance you've you've walked for so many years, uh, Tony. Uh, and the country, your colleagues are deeply grateful for that. And I know you hear that a lot, but I can think of no one who really reflects in action, not just in speech, but in what you've done. Uh, you reflect uh, the best of us and the best amongst us, uh, the pursuit of knowledge for the sake of it, its application to be available to all who need it, and to fight for that when we don't see that. Uh, and you have always been that for me and for colleagues at NIH, NIAID, people in the, in the director leadership level have always looked to you for that vision. Um, and we're grateful for it. You know, I think, um, HIV in many ways created a choice for infectious disease specialists to go down that route or to go down another route in the uh, in the early 80s. And um, I'm I'm curious how you uh, are reacting to the lack of matching that has gone on in the infectious disease fellowship breaks down to 50 56 percent in the uh, in this year's uh, match. And I haven't talked to you about this. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. The workforce manpower issue is right in front of us. Yeah, uh, Eric, that's a really a critical point that I've actually um, addressed that in uh, that uh, editorial I wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine about infectious diseases in uh, December of mm -hmm. last year when the New England Journal asked me to do a commentary on infectious disease. I am extremely dismayed by that. And I think we need to, you know, get a group of us and see if we could seek out what the root causes of that are right now. You know, it could be an economic one in that infectious disease specialists, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have a a gimmick. Uh, we just have experience, knowledge, and our ability, you know, to address extremely important diseases. Um, it, to me, it's almost um, it's almost paradoxical that you're dealing with the last three years 
have been dominated by an infectious disease that has essentially ground the, the activities of the planet to a halt <laughs> for a considerable period of time. Um, and the reality that this is something that is gonna likely happen again <laughs> because of so many circumstances that have not been addressed or changed. Um, and then superimpose upon that, what you alluded to just a short bit ago about the ongoing diseases that have been essentially of a pandemic nature for decades, if not centuries, and yet the normal everyday bread and butter of infectious diseases, hospital acquired infections and other types of diseases, both pediatric and adult, I, I, I am dismayed by the fact that we could not fill our infectious disease fellowships, I mean, dramatically didn't fill it. It isn't as if we missed by a couple of percentage points. It was really extraordinary. And I think we just really need to get out there and just keep trying to articulate to the younger generation how important, but also how exciting the field of infectious diseases are. I mean, it, it, it has all of the elements of somebody whose character is want to identify something, want to do something about it, want to prevent it, and want to treat it. I mean, you know. The magic bullets, the yeah. magic bullet group, yeah. Exactly, it just, it, it, it's very distressing. Maybe that's our next endeavor, Eric, sometime, it, you know, maybe through the Infectious Disease Society of America, who I, I know, Carlos Del Rio is the new yep. president. Yep. Carlos is very much dismayed by this and maybe we could all get together and figure out what we can do to you know to bring attention to the extraordinary attractiveness of this specialty very good i think uh, carlos is spending a lot of time thinking about this that's a great idea mike were you going to um ask some of the sure. questions yeah y yeah, sure. Th and this is such an illuminating conversation. So thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, for your insights, particularly on issues related to uh, how we uh, expand the infectious disease and public health workforce. Um, I, in, in a second, I think my colleague Jeff is going to ask us a, a few questions from the audience, but maybe I can jump in and ask you one, first of all. Um, you know, as Eric alluded to, you've been instrumental in, in the U.S. response to numerous outbreaks over the last 30 years, Ebola, swine flu, uh, the conception of PEPFAR, but also groundbreaking HIV research. Beyond your ID work, you, uh, your rheumatology work is some of the most influential in that discipline, and you're not even a rheumatologist. Um, you've achieved so much, and I'm curious, as you look back on your career, um, what are the things that you're most proud of? You know, Mike, I since my career, for better or worse, was is so long, <laughs> I've had the opportunity to wear you know, three separate hats that overlap. One is as a scientist and a clinician. One is as the director of the NIAID, which as you know, is the largest supporter of basic and clinical research in infectious diseases in the world by far. It's got a $6.4 billion budget. And the third was the privilege that I've had of being the advisor to seven presidents, as you mentioned, that put me in a position to have influence on policy. So if I were to very quickly go through all three of those, I think things that are not particularly well known, but are very gratifying to me, is the research I did, as you mentioned, on inflammatory diseases of blood vessels, the vasculitides, where I developed essentially high remission inducing therapeutic protocols for diseases that otherwise were uniformly fatal. And then when I switched my interest to HIV, I have been working for the last 41, 42 years on delineating the pathogenic mechanisms of HIV. So that I feel very good about and proud of. In my role as director of NIAID, uh, one of the things that I did among several was to create the Division of AIDS in 1984 when people just didn't want to get interested in HIV. And that, that division uh, 
which was the, the largest division of the Institute, has now, in collaboration with the pharmaceutical companies, been responsible, directly or indirectly, for the developing of the constellation of drugs that we all use now to essentially get the level of virus to below detectable, not only save the lives of persons with HIV, but make it essentially impossible for them to transmit the virus to others. That has saved millions of lives. Again, that I feel very good about. I didn't do it alone. I had a lot of help from a lot of people. And the last one is one we've already alluded to, to have had the privilege of being asked by President Bush to be a person who's one of the major architects of the PEPFAR program that now has saved 25 million lives. I think that's something that not only I as an individual, that would be provincial, but the entire country should be really very proud of that this nation invested $110 billion and has wound up saving 25 million lives, mostly in the developing world, mostly in Southern Africa. So those are things that we should feel proud about as a country, not just as an individual. You know, people, um, makes it makes me smile to hear you say that, Tony. Uh, people don't realize uh, your really central role in convincing President Bush, uh, helping him understand the moment, the opportunity, and finally helping him make that, that decision. Uh, it's a remarkable series of conversations and convenings that at some point when you write when you write your book uh should be a chapter but um a short version of it would probably be of interest to people to hear i don't want you to feel like you need to go on and on with it but do you have any like a a, a shorter version of, of yeah well the shorter version is when i came back <laughs> from africa and and told the the president that the first step would be you might remember when uh, when we when we had nevirapine available to prevent mother-to-child transmission, I said that a single dose to the mother during labor and a single dose to the baby could essentially diminish by at least 50% transmissibility if we made an investment of $500 million that we could probably dramatically diminish mother-to-child transmission. He thought it was a great idea. I presented it in the Roosevelt Room of the White House on the West Wing and he said, go ahead and do it. And I thought that was it. I thought that was going to be the program. And then just as I was walking out of the room, he grabbed me and said, no, no, wait a minute. He says, I want you to do something much, much more transforming. So go back to the drawing board and put together a program that's transforming and accountable for the entire population of people at risk for this. And I told him, I said, you know, that's going to be a lot of money. <laughs> And he said very, very calmly, well, let me worry about the money. You just put together the program. So over the next literally eight months, from April, May of 2002, until his State of the Union address in January 28th of 2003, I worked back and forth, going back and forth multiple times. When I say multiple, I mean every week, but sometimes days at a time at the White House, fine tuning that program with the help of Mark Dibel, who worked with me as my assistant at the time, who also, as you know, became one of the, the, the ambassadors like yourself of PEPFAR. So that was an eight month period. I didn't convince anybody overnight. <laughs> it went from the spring of 2002 to the end of 2002. But thankfully the end result was that the president in his great wisdom bought the program and now we have it as a reality. And the rest is history, no doubt about it. Thank you for that. I can remember uh, Bill Papp and Paul Farmer uh, talking about nurse nurse led uh, health care programs, and uh, we we presented a, a Rwandan Kigali uh, <laughs> example. There were few and far between in those years. Yeah, but but Eric, I, I have to say, since this is a, a large UCSF audience, that people need to know your role in that. And this is a, a short story that I got to tell because <laughs> is that at the very, very end, when they were saying, well, uh, can we really believe Tony Fauci, this white guy in a suit in Washington, tell us what to do? 
in Southern Africa. He says, you got to get some people to get together and come to Washington and convince OMB whether or not this is really a feasible plan and Fauci's correct, or is he just blowing smoke? So I immediately got on the phone and called a few people, namely Jean Pop, who was in Haiti, Paul Farmer, uh, Peter McGenyi, uh, and my good friend Eric Goosby. <laughs> <laughs> and we came to Washington and had dinner in an Italian restaurant one yeah, night. Yeah. And we said, guys, you got to go to the White House and convince OMB that this is a project that will work. And Eric, I don't know, I think you, you were with, um, uh, what was the, the, the organization you were with at the time in Rwanda? Uh, uh, Pangea. Pangea. Pangea, right. Yeah. You were with yeah. Pangea at the yeah. time. And I remember yeah. calling you up and saying, Eric, you got to get your butt to Washington in 48 yep, I hours. <laughs> I, was, I was in the Nairobi airport when the <laughs> overhead came. I thought somebody died, but uh, it was Dr. Tony Fauci finding me in the... Uh, in the bowels of the of the airport, but I'll never forget that. That's quite a that's quite a memory. Thank you for that. Hi, Dr. Fauci. Um, <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks again for being here. I speak on behalf of my colleagues when I say it's absolutely thrilling to have you uh, speaking to our community. <clears throat> a couple um, questions from the audience. Um, how do you rise above the political climate of distrust in science and political conflict as well? Um, and how do you stop yourself from dropping the proverbial tow towel, or perhaps Lucia, it might be a mic, I'm not sure, and continue to do what is best for everyone? You know, thanks, Jess. That, that, that's a, a question that's, that's hanging over us right now as you speak. Because right now, unfortunately, we are experiencing a degree of divisiveness in our country that is the worst possible element to be uh, essentially pervasive when you're dealing with an outbreak that as historic and transforming as COVID-19 has been over the last now more than three years. And the answer is, it is not easy, but you have got to stick with the data and the facts and the science. This becomes particularly difficult when you are living in an arena, all of us are, of what I call the normalization of untruths, where there's so much misinformation and disinformation there that the scientific method and the scientific approach is given short shift as if it's as invalid as anything else. So. You know, that's not a satisfactory answer to whoever posed the question, except you never, ever throw in the towel, ever. <laughs> you know, you just got to, you know, you got to think of that movie, The Raging Bull with Robert De Niro, when he was up against the rope and Sugar Ray Robinson kept on punching him and punching him and he didn't go down. <laughs> you know, you don't go down. You never throw in the towel on this, ever. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, with hindsight being 2020, what are a few key lessons learned and alternative uh, procedures the scientific and governing bodies could incorporate for the next big disease, the next novel pathogen, and uh, to prevent it from coming becoming a pandemic? Um, and in addition, how can we better navigate the political polarization that will inevitably occur? Well, the, the answer to the second question is the one I just gave you is that you know we are we are facing that and we've just got to never ever back off on the truth and science but you know the lessons we've learned are, are pretty clear Jess it's that pandemics occur they, they are not theoretical uh they've been with us before history was recorded we experienced them in our relatively short life on this planet multiple pandemics. You know, Eric and I have just been talking about several of them, you know, HIV, uh, pandemic flu, and now COVID-19. So the, the lesson is they do occur. But the other lesson is that you've got to look at it in two general categories, the way I, I, I like to look at the response. And one is the scientific preparedness and response. And the other is the public health preparedness and response. They are separate, but they overlap. 
the big success in COVID-19 was our scientific preparedness and response, where if you look at the vaccine, the decades of investment in basic and clinical biomedical research has allowed us with the new platform technologies of mRNA and the imaging design based on structure-based vaccine design allowed us to get a vaccine from the time we had the sequence on January 10th, 11 months later, to have a vaccine that not only is safe, but that's highly, highly effective in 11 months. I mean, that is beyond unprecedented because that normally would have taken about seven years to do. That was the success story. The challenge that we've got to correct is the stumbling through the public health response, where we realized that we thought we were very well prepared from a local and national and international public health standpoint, and we were not. So the lesson may be pay attention to public health, particularly local public health. Because when it comes to public health, it ultimately is all local. It turns into global, but global is a combination of all locals. So that's what we've got to remember. Absolutely. Um, a question from the audience. Do you feel the NIH has invested enough in understanding health disparities? Would you do anything differently with regard to resource allocation on this topic? The answer is we've done a lot, particularly most but it has to be a high, high priority because, you know, health disparities have always been there. Every once in a while, you get a disease that shines a bright spotlight on health disparities. HIV was one of them, where you have 13% of the population is African-American and 44% of all the new infections are among african American. You have the stigma associated with it, particularly among Southern African-American cohorts of individuals. That's the first thing. But the real recent spotlight on health disparities has been COVID-19, where, as you know, not only the increased risk because of the economic situation that puts minorities in jobs that make them necessitating being out in the community exposed to an infection. But once they do get infected, the underlying conditions among African Americans and to some extent Hispanics and Native Americans are the underlying conditions that when they do get infected, put them at a much higher risk of a severe outcome. And we've seen that with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease. Those are social determinants of health those are not racially genetically determined. So they didn't start 10 years ago. And this is the thing that, that sometimes rankles people when you say it, but it's true. It started with slavery and then the post-slavery era where the disenfranchisement and the lack of accessibility of minority populations continues to this day. So if you were gonna address the social determinants of health. It isn't an overnight or one or two year endeavor. It's gotta be measured in decades. And one of the problem is that our corporate memory of these things disappear when the acute challenge disappears. So hopefully we'll have durable corporate memory that we have to have a decades long commitment to addressing the social determinants of health. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Um, there's been a lot of speculation in the media, as you're well aware, about how the pandemic started um, and can be yet another divisive, divisive topic. Do you think it's important to find out exactly how it started and if so, why? Yeah, it certainly is important and you have to keep a totally open mind as to how it happened. But unfortunately, this arena has become highly <laughs> politicized as you just look at what's going on with the committees in Washington. It, you know, it's, it's very much politicized. So the answer is yes, we've got to keep an open mind. We've got to find, and if we can't find out, Jess, let's say we can't, let's say we'll never know. 
then there's one or two possibilities. It was either a natural uh, occurrence and, and, a, and a spillover naturally from an animal to a human, or it had something to do with a laboratory leak, if you want to use that terminology. Whichever it is, even though the scientific data accumulated by highly qualified virologists strongly indicate that it was very likely a natural occurrence, but you can't assume that because it could be either. Why don't we do everything we can to prevent both possibilities in the future? That's the lesson. Instead of burning up so much energy, politicizing that now, why don't we say both are possible? Let's put our efforts into preventing either of them from ever happening again. Wonderful. Two final questions for you, Dr. Fauci. Um, will we get a vaccine and a cure for HIV? <laughs> a quick one for you. <laughs> the answer is, I can't tell you whether we will. Uh, uh, I can tell you we're not giving up on the effort of an HIV vaccine. As you know, large clinical trials based on a non-neutralizing antibody approach have not been successful. So the work really needs to focus on the induction, which is very difficult because natural infection doesn't even do it that well, um, is to induce broadly neutralizing a durable antibody. So the answer is, I can't tell you if it's gonna happen, but we're still trying. Number two, a cure. You know, it really depends on what you mean by a cure. If you're talking about eradication of HIV, that's gonna be quite problematic. That doesn't mean we're not gonna be striving to get there. We'll continue to work on that. But look where we are right now, where you have drugs that can now be given in an injectable form every several months that can maintain the level of virus to below detectable level. That's pretty good. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to completely eradicate the virus, but we've come a very, very long way with therapy that I think we should really be very proud of. Wonderful. You have many members of the future of the public health field on this call, and you've given us great imagery to be inspired. We will never throw in the towel. In the last minute, do you have any other important takeaways for this younger generation? Um, where is the field going, and how can we make sure we're there and prepared to respond? Yeah, you know, my message that I, I, I give to younger people who are, who are listening, I mean it sincerely from my heart. <laughs> And that is, you have an opportunity looking forward at your stage in your career where you have, you know, you know, total potential of what you can do in a field that's amazingly exciting, not only exciting for your personal, uh, you know, uh, gratification, if you want to use that word, but the potential impact you can have in a positive way on so many people. In some respects, you know, you look at me at my stage and my age and people say, wow, isn't it wonderful that you're there? You know, part of me deep down wishes I was the 25 year old guy who was just out of my residency going into a training program in infectious diseases because the excitement that's ahead for you is really going to be extraordinary. So go for it. It's going to be a great future for you. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Fauci. We're, we're almost at time. Um, let me just end with a brief reminder. Next, next seminar will be on April 18th with Monica Gandhi. Special shout out to, to Eric uh, Gooseby and the team behind the scenes today for, for uh, organizing, especially Kate and Sander back. But let me close with a, a quote from Shakespeare. No legacy is so rich as honesty. Dr. Fauci, we are especially for, uh, grateful for your legacy of, of honest, sound science. Um, so, on behalf of the UPSF community that are here today, let me just close with a sincere and heartfelt thank you for your years of service. We, we really appreciate um, all that you've done over the, the course of your career. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. And Eric, thank you. Love you, my friend. Love you too, Tony. Everyone does. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right.